I'm Nancy Ammerman. I'm a professor of sociology of religion. Uh, I teach at Boston University, and uh, my field of research has mostly encompassed religion in the U.S., uh, first of all, looking at conservative religious uh, movements in the U.S., uh, started out studying fundamentalism and uh, the changes in uh, denominations in the U.S., but I've spent a lot of time in the last uh, decade or two looking particularly at uh, religious organizations, uh, congregations, denominations, and the way they are a part of the communities that they're uh, located in. Uh, looking at their contribution to community life, to the kinds of services that are uh, available to people in local communities, and also looking at the individuals in, uh, in religious life, looking at how individuals, whether or not they're involved in a particular religious community, looking at how religious practices, spiritual practices, ideas about uh, relationship to something beyond ourselves is a part of people's everyday lives. I've been invited uh, to become a part of this very large endeavor that I'm not sure I entirely understand the full scope of it. It's going to be really interesting to see uh, how it unfolds, but my understanding of my own role is that uh, along with my colleague Grace Davey uh, from the United Kingdom, uh, we are uh, working on assembling a group of contributing authors uh, who will be working together to talk about uh, religion as it is a part of uh, the social fabric of societies around the world and looking at how those religious communities and ideas and traditions are related to the various issues that confront uh, societies around the world and how we can think about the, the contribution of social science to understanding that relationship and understanding how we might make progress in uh, forming societies that are more humane, that uh, are able to enable the flourishing of all different kinds of people in different kinds of communities around the world. I've been involved uh, in a variety of uh, research over my career that has uh, had to do with the, the role of religious communities in both seeking change in the larger society and in how the changes that have happened in the larger society have affected those, uh, those religious communities. So for instance, uh, one of the uh, pieces of research that I was involved in was uh, looking at changes that took place in a particular denomination, where that denomination uh, was, uh, it was a, the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, it had been a, uh, a denomination that was uh, really lodged in a traditional kind of Southern culture. And that Southern culture had changed really significantly, particularly in the post-Civil Rights era, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. Uh, the kind of the culture that that denomination existed in had undergone enormous change. And one part of the denomination was becoming more progressive and more sort of integrated into a larger, more cosmopolitan uh, kind of culture. And another part of the denomination really wanted to try to kind of resist that and reclaim its traditional roots. And that resulted in a conflict uh, in the denomination. Uh, the more conservative side of, of the denomination was able to uh, gain control of the, uh, the governing mechanisms in the denomination and transform the denomination really into a much more conservative denomination than it had been even in the past. Uh, and that meant that the more progressive uh, groups within the denomination had to form new organizations, essentially form a new denomination, uh, and so I watched that unfold, documented the way that movement for social change, in this case a, a movement for more traditionalist social change, was able to succeed uh, in uh, changing a very large religious organization. The Southern Baptist Convention at that time was the, the largest Protestant denomination uh, in the U.S., so a you know, fairly major kind of social movement and movement for social change. 
Uh, since that time, I've also looked at the way religious congregations and other kinds of religious organizations join up in partnership with other kinds of organizations in their communities to, uh, to deal with very local kinds of change. So you have a, a community where, um, where youth is, is an issue and you know, people are worried about their kids, worried about drugs, worried about whether their kids are gonna get in trouble in various kinds of ways. So you know, they recognize that this is not the kind of thing that any one congregation or any one person, you know, any one organization can necessarily address. They need to really bring a, a lot of people together. So what we find in those kinds of situations is often that there'll be a particular community organization that kind of takes the lead on an issue, but they draw in a congregation here, a congregation there, non-affiliated people here, and are able to put together resources in a community to think about how to seek change that is particularly relevant to their community. They may also be drawing in resources from outside the community, from governmental organizations. So that forming, uh, forming of networks is one of the things that I've done a lot of work on studying, how one particular organization can be a kind of hub for bringing in resources and people to, uh, to seek change in a community. I think when we think about the role of religion in society today, that probably one of the biggest uh, issues that people are facing around the world is increasing levels of diversity. That in many parts of the world, if you looked 50, 100 years ago, people might have been living in communities where everybody around them basically had the same religious affiliation. Today, that's hardly the case almost anywhere in the world. Um, people are migrating, uh, people are changing themselves from one religion to another. So we find in almost any community you have many different kinds of religious affiliations as well as lots of people who aren't affiliated at all. And people figuring out how to deal with that level of diversity is something that I think is, uh, is an issue that is a policy issue, but it's also a research issue. It's an issue of how do, how do we understand what the dynamics are? Uh, what kinds of things facilitate peaceful coexistence? What kinds of things facilitate conflict? The responses to diversity around the world are enormously various. Uh, on the one hand, we have armed conflict that is tragic. Sometimes it's literally wars. Uh, sometimes it is more localized and individual incidents of uh, hate crimes, shootings, really tragic kinds of ways in which people who are confronted with religious traditions that they see as alien, that they perhaps see as dangerous, responding in violent and, and really unfortunate terrible, uh, tragic kinds of ways. And that, that seems to be happening across lots of different religious, you know, it's not any one religious tradition that is, is either the object of the violence or the perpetrator of the violence. It's going on every which direction, you know, Buddhist, Muslim, Muslim, Christian, Christian, uh, Muslim, Christian, Sikh, everything. Um, so one way that, that the diversity is dealt with is tragically uh, with violence. Uh, another way that the diversity is dealt with is a variety of kinds of regulation. Uh, in most parts of the world, the government at the level of the nation uh, has laws that says you know, these religious traditions are okay, these aren't, these practices are okay, these aren't. So it's sort of drawing boundaries and, and regulating uh, what religious traditions are permitted, which ones aren't, and what kinds of practices are permitted and which ones aren't. There are some places in the world that try to be very open to virtually all religious traditions and to make 
the practice of religion as unregulated and free uh, as possible. But I think it's probably safe to say there's no place in the world that's utterly open and says absolutely anything goes. Uh, in the U.S., we like to think of ourselves as a very religiously tolerant and very open place, and we probably are among the most diverse places um, in the world. But we've got limits. Um, you know, people who want to practice Santeria can't necessarily do animal sacrifice, which is part of their uh, tradition. Uh, we've had uh, people who want to smoke peyote as part of uh, a religious uh, ceremony. That gets regulated. So we've got lots of limits uh, in the U.S. as well. So, you know, religious practice is always something that is, is going to be debated and is probably going to be regulated uh, in one way or another. And then at the local, sort of more informal level, there are lots of places all over the world where people are being very intentional about trying to bring people together across religious traditions. Um, sometimes that's a, in a kind of, uh, let's talk about our different religious traditions, have dialogue, um, and try to get to know each other, and maybe even try to find the places of theological common ground. But often it's also very pragmatic, um, what a colleague of mine used to call street-level ecumenism. That is, we've got a problem, we want to work together, you know, we need to build housing for poor people, or we need to have a, you know, a shelter, or we need to take care of refugees, or whatever the problem is, we, we actually come together and work together as Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, you know, whatever the religious tradition, around a common problem. And so that kind of uh, working together across diverse religious traditions is one of the things that I think we see as one of the most constructive and uh, fruitful ways that people are dealing with the diversity that they encounter in, in their everyday lives. Uh, I think one of the big challenges for this project is in fact for our group of, of researchers around the religion and society uh, questions to, to really grapple with the policy uh, part of the, the agenda, to think about what the kinds of policies are that seem to be most fruitful for allowing uh, religious traditions to contribute to society and not to be hindrances to the flourishing of a society. Um, I think I come at this from my very American perspective uh, and from, from, from a place where an openness to diversity in, of religious traditions is, uh, has worked pretty well in our history. I mean, we've had our history of religious violence by all means, but it has, in general, been less egregious than in many other parts of, of the world. And there are some mechanisms in place for adjudicating those, uh, those differences. So, you know, I think one of the things that policymakers probably need to think about is precisely how to, how to manage diversity how to allow diversity and yet provide an arena in which the conflicts that come about as a result of the diversity uh, can be managed, can be adjudicated. So when people think about the role of religion and religious diversity in, uh, in the world today, they often think about conflict and violence. But one of the things that I think we will also be looking at uh, as we do this work is the role of religious organizations and religious people as partners with public policymakers and uh, public officials in the delivery of social services, in the building of communities uh, around the world. I think one of the things that we've certainly seen in North America and in Europe is that religious organizations are often right on the front lines of both identifying what the issues are in a community and 
giving voice to those issues in ways that bring them to the larger public policy arena uh, and mobilizing people in communities to, uh, to articulate what their needs are uh, to policymakers, but also participating in the kind of network of service provision and support that, uh, that societies need. So when you have uh, policymakers that are trying to think about you know, how do we deliver healthcare services? How do we deliver welfare services? How do we deliver services that will support families and, and so forth? Uh, it's often the case that either religiously affiliated uh, NGOs or congregations are, they're right there in the communities and they're able often to be partners with uh, policymakers and with government organizations to to deliver those services. So both in terms of articulating the needs and delivering the services, you often have mediating structures, these uh, NGOs of various kinds that are often religiously based. And policymakers need to understand that larger network of organizations that they have in effect available to them as effective uh, spokespeople and deliverers of services uh, if they simply will open their eyes and pay attention. Um, I think one of the exciting things about taking on this project is that uh, our group of scholars who are going to be thinking about the role of religion in society and as it, uh, society progresses are really starting from the assumption that religious communities, religious ideas, religious traditions and practices are almost in every part of the world going to be an important part of the society that, that we're looking at. Even in societies that seem to be quite secular, there's likely to be an enormously important religious institutional or even sort of religious practice role uh, there in the society. I think social scientists 40, 50 years ago might have assumed that social progress meant religion would disappear and we would all simply be enlightened beings uh, using our rationality and that would be how we would solve the problems of society. I think one of the things that's exciting for me is to bring into this conversation the fact that people are bringing their religious traditions together with their rationality and their ways of thinking about progress, and how can we really creatively think about those things acting in concert rather than assuming that in order to have progress you have to get rid of religion. <laughs>